for India to define what, is, what it means to be green, I think it is also an agenda for the entire world because it's very much as you set out. The fact is that today we are clear that we are faced with something as catastrophic as climate change. We also know very clearly that this is because climate change is intrinsically as yet linked to economic growth. And that countries in the process of building up wealth have accumulated this huge stock of emissions in the atmosphere, which today completely, you know, threaten to destroy so much of the world. So in some senses, climate change is about growth. And climate change and combating climate change is about reinventing what we mean by growth. And I think that's really the challenge also for India when you look at environment till issues. Uh, I'll start off with the issue of renewables, which I think is a very interesting uh, way to understand this. You know, all over the world, when you hear about low carbon economies, there's a sort of sense that the world has invented a solution in the name of renewables. Now, I'm a very strong believer of renewable energy, but I know in terms of the figures today, the primary energy supply of the world, less than 1% comes from renewable energy, <coughs> new renewable energy. And when I say new renewable energy, it is, by, it is uh, wind, it is solar, it is geothermal, and a technology that I think is a phenomenally important technology, which is cogeneration and biomass. But it's still less than 1%. The bulk of what you classify as renewable in the world comes from the chulas of poor women. So please understand the arrogance of the rich today who talk about renewables but have never reinvented their energy system to make it work. And that's really the big challenge for India today. We talk about wind glibly. We talk about 8,000 megawatts of wind power in the world. But our plant load factor for wind is less than 15%. We don't generate wind energy. We've used wind as a tax scam, literally. Now, if we are serious about environmental issues and reinventing what we mean by growth, we will have to do a lot more than what we have done till date. And I believe the driver for change in India is coming not from industry. And, and I'm sorry to say this, and I hope you will not kill me for saying it, but I don't think it's coming from industry. I think it is coming from poor communities in India who are asking industry to listen to their voice. It's not a voice of Naxalites. It's not a voice of some competitors paying off poor people for protesting against a thermal power plant, protesting against mining happening, say, in Goa or in Bilari or in, uh, or in Orissa. It's about poor communities who are literally saying to industry today, environment is our survival base, that we need the water, we need the forests, we need the land for our survival. And it's also poor communities saying to industry that when you take away our water, which you do because of your process of industrialization and urbanization, you don't give us anything in return. This bottled water that you have in front of you comes to you without paying for the water itself. That's the kind of subsidy that we want for our consumption. And that's the kind of subsidy which, to me, is the root of the climate crisis. It's the root of the financial crisis, if I may say so as well, whether it's the automakers bailout yesterday <coughs> or it's the banks which have collapsed because of the loans they've given to people who can't pay back. We have subsidized consumption to such an extent that the world is today crying out in pain. So in some senses, if we are serious about being green, then perhaps it is for India to think differently, think out of the box, think big, completely big, perhaps mad. And only then can we reinvent our pathway to growth. It doesn't have to mean, as Mr. Mitra said to me the last time when I was saying this, if you follow what Sunita says, we'll be living in the caves. <laughs> I'm not asking you to live in the caves, but I'm certainly asking you to think differently about what we mean by growth, we want well-being for all. We want affordable transport for all. We want affordable housing for all. We want water for all. And we have to make sure that we can do that by reinventing what are the technologies of the day, by reinventing the politics of the day. And in that, 
Business can play a role, but as yet, Indian business is doing what the rest of the world's business wants to do. A little bit of greenwash and a lot of big claims. It's not good enough. Well, thank you for that very passionate statement, and I hope in our, in our panel discussion we'll get into a discussion about <laughs> contributions by business as well. Um, uh, so, Hale, maybe you can begin a, a conversation about the impact of the world economic crisis on, on, uh, on the challenge uh, that we have, uh, and, and, and to use that as a way to speak about how you think uh, India's path can best be directed through this uh, uh, transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Yes. Uh, Suhail. Uh, I won't know as much about renewables and fossil fuels as the previous speaker does and will. I think the key question, <clears throat> and it's very rare that uh, Sunita Narayan and I agree on a few things, but I will say that That's there is dangerous. lip service. I don't agree, Sohel. Correct. <laughs> there, is, there is lip service in many areas in this country because it's always the, the tail wagging the dog. You don't have policies that force transparency, probity in actually embracing the concept of green. You have people within industry and outside in the political classes which also bestow the Padma Awards on, on eminent citizens, so it's that government which then harbors, creates policies which are a lip service, which, are, which is all about window dressing. I see three or four problems and I will outline the solutions because I, I don't wish this to become a panel discussion where we debate the arrogance of the rich and the, and the rootedness of the poor because I don't think it's, it's us versus them because that kind of a debate will never have resolution. I see three fundamental issues. One, <clears throat> any economic crisis forces inward thinking, never outward thinking. The bailouts that have happened will weaken rather than strengthen those sectors. And mark my words, it will. So what you will see is this economic downturn will be used by some as a lamppost for support, by others as a lamppost for illumination. But I don't think we will make the progress we need to make in the whole green domain. We will use this as an excuse to postpone. We will use this as an excuse to obfuscate. But we will not embrace the core issues as we should. Point number two, I think a lot of what Sunita said makes a lot of sense to a very few people. Because that's the nature of the beast. We need to popularize, we need to make green relevant only when it is understood by the people who are either abusing the process or participating in it. You don't create allies by first establishing enmity. So it's not about whether it's just the chula burners or whether it's about civil society or whether it's about industry not paying for water. I think the fundamental issue is green today is relevant only to the classes, unfortunately, while it impacts the masses. So how do we make green an important political agenda? Because let's face it, no matter what you might say, if politically green is not relevant, is not an issue, no action will be taken. You have seen this with regard to terror. I mean, it took forever to sack an incompetent, inept, inarticulate home minister. It took lots of loss, uh, a loss of a lot of lives. My third point is that there must be, and here I'm not the expert, but I can only say it from a strategic perspective, you can't do everything at the same time as, as this country. I mean, we're not equipped to multitask. We believe we're inge ingenious in many ways, but we're not multitaskers. Can this panel, people like Sunita, Jamshed, Dhruv, Dhruv, whose business uh, uh, largely is, is part of this green domain, can we come up with a roadmap which says that if there are five things that are critically impacting India and through India the world, what is their order of priority? What do we need to do? And how quickly do we need to do it? Because you can continue to have yet another seminar one year later. But will we have a roadmap which either delineates the path on and or creates measurement tools? So I would say if we address these three issues from the bucket of logic, from the bucket of strategy, create involvement of the masses, <coughs> create involvement of every person 
Look at re rehashing even your school curricula if you need to. For that, you need inspired leadership. And I'm not saying inspired political leadership alone. I'm talking about inspired leadership in the corporate world, inspired leadership within the education domain. But that's, to my mind, the way forward.